I would like to ask a, a friend of the Casa, one of our board members, Antonio Monda, who is also the person thanks to whom I met Anselma Dell'Olio, to tell us a couple of things about the film before it starts. Please welcome Antonio Monda. Buonasera, buonasera. I will be extremely brief. I would like only to say that this film is not dangerous but very necessary because it's a, it's a great heart of love and a great didactic love uh, uh, work on a great underrated sometime and often so forgotten great master of Italian cinema Marco Ferreri. I also would like to add that I'm very very jealous because uh, this beautiful beautiful work went to another festival a minor festival in, in the Laguna in Italy so I from the distance was admiring and I still admire uh, this this film. I strongly recommend it to watch all the films by Marco Ferreri. This is not only a great introduction, but also a beautiful way to understand the man, not only the, 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 the director. So congratulations, my friend Anselma. Thank you, and enjoy the film. Grazie, Antonio. I didn't present Antonio with all his titles, but as you know, he's the director of the Rome Film Festival, and that's why he's envious, because Anselma's film went to the Venice Film Festival that he didn't even mention. Uh, Julian, can we have the words back on the screen for a second? So if some of you have these uh, devilish devices with you, telephones and so on, do not turn them off now, keep them on and let people know that you are here watching Anselma Dell'Olio's film on Marco Ferreri, and uh, then let them know what you think about it. Make them envious. Make your uh, Facebook, Twitter friends envious about the experience you're about to live. Um, Anselma, do you, would you like to come to the stage and just say hi to the audience and then we'll meet them at the end of the film. Please welcome Anselma Dell'Olio. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say about Marco Ferreri, people said He's been forgotten. The producer called me two years ago and said, Anselma, he's been dead 20 years and nobody remembers him anymore. I say he's been repressed. That's the dangerous but necessary because he had very profound philosophical ideas, but he was also a great poet and a visionary. So I'm very happy to present this film and I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. I'll see you after for the Q&A. Stay with us. And Selma, I didn't introduce you formally before the screening, so just a couple of words. Uh, Anselma is a film critic, uh, and especially she works on television. She has a very popular rubric, even if it's relegated in the wee hours of the night, but, yeah, with, a, morning, yeah. but with a very solid foundation of followers. And uh, what I can say is that she's never banal. And I get to meet her when she comes to New York, and she's coming from one festival or the other. And you get an absolutely different perspective on any film uh, from her than you would get from any other film critic. And you decided to go on the other side of the camera mm -hmm. and become a director yourself to pay this beautiful homage to Marco Ferrer. And we are delighted that you uh, have decided to do this. And you have a personal connection with Marco Ferrer. Oh, yes. And with Gerard Depardieu in particular, aren't, yes. aren't you particularly proud of having smashed the bottle <laughs> on the head of Gerard Depardieu? That's great. It's a dream okay, that many of us would have. I always wanted to be coached in his dialogue at 2 a.m. in the room. <laughs> <laughs> so I didn't. And he, had, he had a guy come from France. So. <laughs> no, 2 in the morning, I'm not doing it. <laughs> and in that film, aside from this uh, great cameo, you also had a role uh, as an assistant of Ferreri, yes. especially. I'm Tom Bye Bye Monkey. Um, he, it was the first film he shot in English, and he knew his, his English was not that good, and he knew he needed someone to be his ears. And so he heard, he got my name from another a very fine director in Austria named Elio Petri. And so she was the first of all. Excuse me. Oh, Sorry. Oh, okay. 
uh, and Elio Pedro gave my name. I was living in LA at the time. He, he called me up and um, Marco was unusual in, in that he never asked for a CV. He never wanted to know what you had done or who you'd worked with, what your credits were. He would talk to you for a while. He invited me for lunch and we would, he would look at you with that very penetrating gaze. He did have a, a, a look that would go right through you and just talk and then he would decide whether to offer you the role and he told me he needed he needed someone to be his, he needed someone to revive, first of all to rewrite the dialogue. It had been translated from the Italian in a way that was unsatisfactory and so he needed it to be real dialogue and so he wanted me to do that. And then later he asked me to be the director of the feminist theater and he didn't know that I had had a, fem I had been the director of a feminist theater. He had no <laughs> idea. He knew I'd been a feminist but he didn't know that. But he had that kind of, he had a, a magic quality to him, a kind of, he was a bit of a medium in some ways. Uh, and sen so, I came to, so I came to New York and uh, we started, we shot here for, on that, that was that landfill that later they built West Bath on, mm -hmm. that you see where the King Kong yeah, lying on yeah. there. Yeah. And so I had on the earphones and I always work closely, as a dialogue coach, I always work very closely with the uh, sound man. But in this case, he wanted me to be right next to him. Uh, and, and on a set, a director, uh, after, after a shot, after a um, uh, chock, they're called in Italian, it will usually looks first to the cameraman. In this case, it was Luciano Tovoli, a very fine cameraman. He looks to the cameraman to see if it was okay for him or her. And, but in this case, he would look at me first because it was direct sound. And direct sound was just beginning to happen in Italy at, at that time. Up until the 70s, until the late 70s, all Italian films were dubbed not just American films or foreign films, because we didn't have sound studios. You'd hear, there would, they'd have a guide track, and so everything was up. This was going to be direct sound, so it wasn't something he'd done very often, and he was very nervous about it because he knew that Americans uh, care about direct sound. They don't like dubbing, they won't put up with it. So it was very, very important, and so he wanted me to be never more than an inch from him which is hard on a film set because the technicians come through, the guys come through saying, move or bleed. <laughs> and you don't want to bleed, so you move. And I didn't move far, but that would, it would just send him into rages against me. And so about four or five times a day this would happen and everything would stop and he would just yell at me for 10 minutes, it's like an aria. He was also venting his, his nerves and frustration. He was producing the film mm -hmm. as well. So there was an, in English the first time in New York. So, but you know, if you weren't the butt of it, it was actually kind of fun. People <laughs> would laugh because he would do these arias in which he would say things like, you give me hemorrhoids. <laughs> so people would break up and you're, you're biting your lip, you know, looking at the ground with eye, sunglasses and a hat pulled down over you thinking, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you, I hate you. <laughs> Uh, until I had a breakthrough. A and the breakthrough was after about a week of this, the first people are sympathetic to you because you're getting all this flack and then afterwards you're the one that's re delaying production. So, th uh, but I was, you know, I would think about this and think about this. I did have a break. I understood when I came on the set one day and he just called me, he said, Anselma, and I leapt about this high. And he said, what are you leaping for? I just called your name. So a light bulb went all over my head and the short version is, uh, I just stopped, I was able to stop hating him to understand that it really, his wife would come to me and say, don't take it personally, don't take it, please, please, don't take it personally. It's very hard not to take it personally, but I understand, I, you know, blindingly I made my way to understanding that it wasn't somehow. Uh, and, and the first time he started, after I had this realization, he started on his aria, I was just sort of watching him, and he was funny, and I started to laugh. And he said, why are you laughing? And I said, because you're funny, Marco. And that was it. It never happened again. Simultaneously, because this is how these things happen, the, the Luciano Tovoli, the DP, shot almost the entire film on a tripod. That's not unusual. That, uh, he, almost the whole film. So he said, Anselma, get under the tripod. Because the director was always then. Now they're in a trailer looking at a, uh, a, 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 a machine. But at that time, the director was on the set and the same with the same line of uh, view as the as the, the the camera, so with me under there with my t pad because I was always rewriting. That was his improvisation. He didn't so much improvise scenes; he improvised dialogue. Yeah, he wanted people to improvise dialogue. He wanted me to improvise dialogue, 
and he ne his, his method of direction was silence. He would never tell you anything. He never, so he'd say, well, Mark, he would say, I want, he would, he would turn his head like this and close his eyes and he had petite mal, so he'd have these little tiny seizures and then he'd say, okay, tell him, and you had three men on the set, Depardieu, Mastroian, and James Coco, tell him, uh, you know what I mean, and he'd walk away. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it took me a while, but eventually got into it and I understood something else. He was really like, it was like really having free shrinkage or actually being paid for <laughs> shrinkage because, because I understood, uh, I ultimately came to understand the thing he hated the most was insecurity. He wanted, he gave you all this responsibility to the people that he chose to work with him. As, as Radu Mihaliano, wonderful director says, he made eight mm -hmm. films with Marco. He gave you enormous responsibility but it was up to you to figure out wh what, not just what he wanted, because he wanted to know what you were going to suggest. He wanted you to use your creativity to give him something that maybe he hadn't thought of. Because if you tell, if a director tells someone that's working for him what he or she wants, you'll turn yourself inside out to give him exactly that. Well, he wasn't, that surprised me. He didn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> but you ultimately could figure that out. Estelle, and what about a young American feminist? That's what you were at that time. Italian and American, because Anselma right. is both right. uh, Italian and American. She's this perfectly <laughs> divided and yes. at the same time very united life <laughs> on the two uh, continents, mm -hmm. California, pre right. to be precise, yeah. and, and Italy. So you, at that time you were a young feminist, very convinced, and you said yeah. you participated. And him being somehow the prophet of the demise of masculinity, and at the uh -huh. same time with, with a very conflictual relationship with, with women. Mm -hmm. uh, was that ever a topic of conversation with him? No, no, it really wasn't. Um, although he did talk, you know, he talked a lot. He had a lot of, in, about his philosophy he would mm -hmm. go on, but I don't remember any specific, discussions of it. I was on burnout at that time. I had left New York. I'd gone to California. It was like, I, you know, after movements do that to you, you get burned out after a while. And I came to Italy and all the women were just discovering it. It was 1977 and they were all really angry and furious. And I was like, oh yeah, uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> uh, we maybe need another way. So I was actually very intrigued because his films are extraordinary. Uh, I would, if anyone wants to start watching his films, I would not start with La Grande Poupe or with Bye Bye Mafia. I would start with the first four, the two, the two uh, Spanish. Spanish films, El Pisito and El Cochecito, the one where there's the, <laughs> <laughs> the race of the um, uh, motorized wheelchairs. Uh, and then the first two Italian films, which one was called, um, I don't know what that one is, it, it's called La, uh, La Peregina, Queen Bee. Mm -hmm. Uh, with Marina Vladi, wonderful, wonderful film, and um, the the ape woman, the second one he did, in in Italy. they he was an immediate success uh, in art films. He went he went to Cannes, he went to all the great festivals. So, they but but when I saw, especially when I went back to look at everything to do this film, and really studied his films, which I hadn't done before, I was astonished about how far ahead he was on everything. He was making films in 1961 uh, and 62 and 63 about things that I had never even seen any woman write or do make a film about or even write creatively about. He was so specific in depicting the conflict in the couple. He really put the couple under the microscope and he really did adore women. And I think, you know, you kn one knows that no matter how much he was yelling or how gruff he could be, somehow deep inside you know that someone is not hostile to you on a very basic level and that he was thinking things and seeing things that nobody was seeing at that time or <laughs> sometimes not even now, except in ways that are extreme and maybe not all that productive. And so my one peculiar thing about your film is that there is no voiceover. Yeah. There is no narration, right. and there is basically no soundtrack, or very little. Just towards the end, the music exactly. comes Exactly. Yes. Uh -huh. And it makes it much more difficult for a director of documentary to give up the idea of a, of a voiceover. The voiceover would have simplified your life greatly. Never and even occurred to me. And the fact is that it's all 
played in the in the montage in the editing. Yes, it's, yes, I and had a, yes. Creating such a solid and consistent discourse without the use of a voiceover must have been quite a it, it worked. It's very it, impressive. It was the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the, you see these films, I've seen so many films that are portraits of a director or somebody that are what I call postage stamps with narration, right? You see, because films are, it's expensive. Even the archival material is expensive. And we had a tiny budget. So, uh, but I said to the, to the producers in the meeting, I said, listen, I gotta use the film. You know, you gotta give me some film. I can't do this without the films because we're talking about a director. And a director is his or her films. So I would have used a lot more if I could have. But so I was able to do that. And, w and I just, it, I had a great editor, Stuart maybe, an Englishman, one of those Englishmen who came to Italy for lunch and never left. <laughs> <laughs> and he's been there about 20 years, he's about 50, and he had never really had a whole film to do before. He'd done a lot of trailers. And so I, talk, I saw various editors' stuff, and some were very lyrical, very elegant, uh, more elegant than his. But he had done all these trailers for NBC Universal film trailers, and I thought, I, when I looked at it, I thought, this guy knows how to rape a film. Because <laughs> that's what I had to do. I had to go into films, take out guts that meant, meant something isolated from the whole, because you can't, don't have time to tell the story. And it's kind of a cheat, really. I think narration is a cheat. Even in, in, in regular feature films, it's kind, it, there are exceptions where it really works. But by and large, it's kind of, it's a way of short, it's a shortcut. Instead of making the images do the work, you're saying it. I don't think it's as effective. I don't think things stay with you the same way. And it's, a, it's, a super, it's superimposing your ideas on, on what's happening. I'd rather, I wanna go into the films and, and find the, him or her saying it or other people talking about it. Um, Benigni said, why don't, aren't you gonna be interviewed? Because I said, incorporate my, Benigni did a wonderful job, I thought. He yeah, did, great. <laughs> amazing. And, uh, fab and the DVD's gonna have the full, all of the full interviews, because those interviews, Serge Tubiana, the, uh, the former uh, uh, editor-in-chief of Cahiers du Cinéma, who adored Marco and was a wonderful, wonderful, brilliant man, his interview, I could have built the whole film around. So the interviews will be on the DVD as extras. And th that, that was really important to me. I mean, I, I don't, I really find that the less, nar less narration is, is more film. Absolutely. You know, it, 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 and the odd thing is, here's something that Italian said to me when, when my colleagues first saw it in a, in a preview before Venice was, wow, you did a lot of work. I thought, well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, I didn't just decide to be an, a director. I would have loved to have been a director long ago. I had directed a couple of documentaries. One, I was the associate director with Anna Reason, who's here today uh, for Canadian television called Whatever Became Of with Fred Astaire, Gloria Swanson, and all the greats. And I would have loved to go on. But anytime I proposed something, people always said, no. This time the producers came to me and said, Anselmo, would you like to do this? I said, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would have done it long ago if I could have. But and, it's perfect time. And you okay. are working on something else that we're not discussing. But, but right. consider yourself invited whenever okay. it's done. Thank and you. And I think now it's time to open uh, to Question. questions in the audience. Comments? If we could have some light in the house, please. Thank you. There, there you go. go. There you are. Yes, please, sir. Yes. How hard was it and how did you go? Who provided? I mean, ah. <laughs> good question. Very good question. On these kinds of films, archival material is really important, particularly for someone who's been dead for 20 years, right? So you don't, you don't have anything really fresh except the things I did, but not immediate. So I had seen, there had been two other documentaries done on him at the 10th anniversary of his death that I saw, and they were what I call the postage stamp mm -hmm. ones, right? <clears throat> not particularly, they're not worried about being elegant, they're just showing you bits and trying, and some, there were some good bits in there, but I knew I'd, I was, didn't want to use things I'd already seen if I could avoid it, even though I might have used them differently, but, uh, and we did this in, by the way, six months, which is a very short time to do this kind of, a documentary takes two years normally. Just the research, the go, you know, getting the rights, this and that. But we were hoping to make it for Khan. We didn't quite, but, uh, but that's what we were doing. And actually, it would have only been two extra months for Venice. So it, it was good to do it fast. And it meant 10, 12-hour days editing, 
seven days a week for two months. But as for the archival footage, so I had uh, assistants. I went and looked. The assistants went into the Raiteke, into the archival, uh, the state archival uh, cinema material. Yeah, yeah, there was uh, stuff, but it wasn't really great. And then my wonderful editor, English editor, Stuart Maybe, ordered something, did something I would never have even thought to do, which is he wanted to get the best DVD prints that he could of the film, so the foot, so it would look good. And we didn't have a, he didn't like the prints we had of La Grande Booth, so he ordered one from England. Now, it just wouldn't have occurred to me to order an Italian film from England, but he knew his providers, and yes, the DVD comes, we slot it in, and there are extras. And in the extras was the con press conference, the, the famous that I'd always <laughs> heard about, that everybody talked about, but I couldn't, I didn't have it to show. I mean, we would have talked about it, but it's a very different effect, even though it's, it's awful quality, right? It's TV stuff that's Grainy, deteriorated, yes, deteriorated in the time, but it's there. You can see that it's contemporary. So that was just plain serendipity, just dumb luck which you rely on a lot when you're making a film. Anyone who's made a film knows that it's a lot of that is just, you know, the fates coming to help you at the right moment and having great, having people who really knew their stuff. The, inter the people I interviewed, I thought were really great. Yeah. I mean, they, they really turned, even people I didn't expect to be that good uh, were good. Actresses are often not great interviews. Mm -hmm. They're actors and actresses, but I, Anna Shigula was great. Isabelle Huppert was a sick. terrible character. She's always yeah. angry. But yeah. then she'd turn it off and then give you this great <laughs> interview. So who cared? You just took the <laughs> abuse and said, okay, <laughs> let's go. And you, once you have the stuff, you don't really care yeah. afterwards how you're treated. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, uh, hi. 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 Mm. And some of the clips that we saw, including, you know, of his treatment and, and his behavior, in my view, uh, of course, they're all out of context. Yes. Unfair. However, I was struck by that. And then you make very brief mention of a wife. So, Jacqueline, I no yeah. Idea of Madeline and had a wife. Yes. <coughs> I didn't have enough stuff on her. I would have put her in. No, she. E she wasn't as critical to his career like, say, a Giulietta Mazzina was for Fellini because she wasn't an actor. She was a French-Canadian, uh, uh, and she produced the film that I worked on, actually. Um, but I only had one person saying something about her that wasn't terribly interesting. I had nothing else. So there was no... He was married to the same woman his whole life, and women loved him. Um, Marina Vladi, I was, uh, that's my one regret. We weren't able to connect. Marina Vladi made a, the... the um, uh, uh, the Queen Bee movie with him. And she gave a great interview that I, that I saw on Archival Fest. I really wanted her, and we just could never meet up. But she adored him. The, the women who worked with him adored him. They said how, how sensitive he was always when the, he never shot a scene that was exploitative, ever. They, you were always comfortable. You'll see. If you decide to go look at the movies, you will see that he ne there's never an erotic moment in those with all the nudity, and he had male frontal nudity with Depardieu in the last film, which I regret to say is the one movie that there doesn't seem to be DVDs for. I would have used it more on the film. I just used a tiny clip because it was a, they were bad copies. The print exists, the 35 millimeter print exists, the guy owns the rights has it, and just won't print the DVDs, which is a, a shame because the feminist trilogy, he always talked about men and women, but the feminist trilogy is The Last Woman, Bye Bye Monkey, and The Future is Woman you know, from the titles right away. So when you see the whole film, including the ones that you let it look to be exploitative, you will see in the context of the film they're anything but. It, the woman always wins. <laughs> and the man always loses, because that's how he felt. He felt that was what was happening. He felt that men had lost their role as reproducers. They really weren't needed anymore. They were they lost their role as providers. Women work and can maintain and support themselves, and that they they suffer from the anomie of existence much more than women do. That women are always close to the earth, close to life. They are always have things to do, mm -hmm. and it was men who were he saw he saw as rudderless, like the two, the little boy, 
and Roberto Benigni on the beach at the end, he always end, almost always ended his films on the water. And those two, the little boy and Benigni, he's the teacher, walk into the water and disappear with the frog. Those were supposed to be polywogs, by the way. <laughs> but they had all died, and they just, they <laughs> improvised that ending with the frog. And the baby you hear crying when the camera goes up and you see the, the boy and the man have disappeared is a little girl, because his girlfriend has given birth. So believe me, there is nobody more feminist than Marco Ferreri. I've never seen a woman do anything even remotely like what he does. Yes? Huh? Yes. Yes. The mother, the la mère est comme la mère. That was his direction to her for the mother of Storia di Piera. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, Tales of Ordinary Mad yeah. Madness from the Charles Bukowski. Yes. What do you think of New York? I mean, we just lost Anne Holland. Yes, I know. Mm. He wasn't. No, he wasn't. I don't know how many of his films are shown here, but only like Grand Bouffe in Amer in, yeah, in America. Uh, uh -huh. It was the most controversial, and yeah, it came. Well, what he he was not what the Italians call esterofilo. He didn't go to. He made movies in Spain and France and Italy and in and in America, not because he he was you know drawn particularly to to knowing other countries, but because he was always looking looking for new stimuli. So he you know he and he would find these places like finding the whole of Leal for uh, Don't Touch the White Woman. And just one night, he was walking past there. My producer, who was his costume designer, was there. And he w they were just walking after dinner and at this big, there's this big hole in the ground with this cliff. And he, he just muttered, because he didn't talk very much. He said to his production uh, person, get me 40, 40 horses. And everybody goes, 40 horses, what for? And then he had already conceived the idea to do a Western in that big hole from Leal in the middle of Paris. So it, it, he, he, it was just stimuli. He, was, he liked the Bukowski stories. They resonated with him. And they, ha he, they were set and he, it was shot both. It, part of it's in Los Angeles and, and a part of it's in. I no. appreciated what you said about the, about the, the little bit with Leal and the little bit with Leal. In, in his direction. Yeah. He, because he didn't give direction. Antonioni didn't give direction. Woody Allen doesn't give direction. They just, you just do your thing. However, as, as uh, Castellito says, who's an actor and uh, a director, yeah, you were free, but up to a point. He, 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 he kept, you know, in that, just remember that in that, in the frame, everything that's in the frame, the di director decides, everything. There isn't a bird, a tree, a leaf, a grain of sand that the director hasn't decided. And so what I love is that when he, about directing actors is what he says in that interview where you just, in the, where he, you see his blue eyes and the blue suit and the, interview is off screen and he says, are you a dictator on the set? And he says, what kind of dictator? I don't even care if they say my words. He did allow a lot of improvisation with, with dialogue. But he, but he would say, when, he said, when an actor has to do something he doesn't want to do, then he thinks he has to go into the drama, drama and get all interior and dramatic. So he would never frustrate them. He would never say, don't do that. He just let them go. And then when they'd finished and they didn't think he was shooting anymore. He just keeps shooting until he got what he wanted with them doing nothing, meaning not overacting, not getting all dramatic. I thought that was fantastic. When I found that, I was really happy because that's like, for actors, that's a very interesting moment of, of directorial uh, license. Um. 
And, and Sam, following up to what you were saying, he was not an esterophile. He was not somebody who wanted to be abroad and go abroad for, Particularly, the, for no. the sake he of it. Did, but but he, he was a truly international director. I mean, yes. Spain, France, the US, uh, actors from all over the place. Um, do we feel a bit homesick for when Italian directors <laughs> had that power of attraction for international stars and international audience. I sure uh, do. <laughs> I mean, I see, you know, I'm a film critic, so I see pretty much everything that comes out every week in Italy, which is most, most American movies and a lot of foreign movies and, of course, Italian movies, and they're pretty depressing by and large. There's just, it's like an era, an era ended in the, at the end of the 70s, and there were people still making, like Marco Ferrari and Philly, still up until, you know, the 90s were still doing dribs and drabs, but it was over. It was over. You just see it. They just the ideas aren't there. The interest isn't there. The the people who are going to be directors want to be directors rather than want to tell a tale. Yeah. They don't seem to have an urgency that they have something to say. Fellini had things to say. Antonioni had things to say. Marco had a lot to say through his characters and through his scripts. And the the people who are directing now in Italy don't seem to. They don't seem to. They they're aesthetically sometimes pleasing. Sometimes they're funny, sometimes they're okay, but by and large, they're pretty mediocre. In fact, they don't generally leave the country. That's one of the signs. And whereas you have directors, now M Marco Ferrari wasn't particularly specifically Italian, but somebody like Fellini certainly mm -hmm. was yeah. very Italian yeah. and yet universal. You don't have that anymore. That's just a rarity. And it's, I think it's because we've everybody, we've talked about this till we're blue in the face in, in Italy. Why, why, why has it changed? Why, why, why? I can only tell from my point of view as a, as a critic, I'm watching so many movies, that the best movies seem to come from countries in turmoil, as Italy was after the Second yeah, World War. Absolutely. The devastating war, 20 years of dictatorship. Uh, you know, they f from 30, I think it was from 38 on, they couldn't see American movies, which really afflicted Fellini a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so Unless you're a member of the Juventus Universitaria Fascista. That was the that goof. were the only the goof because they were the only that had the exception and they, they could, could see American films. I didn't films. know that. They, oh, they yeah. were so Vittorio Mussolini saw that. Exactly, I guess, exactly. Yeah, the so there, movies, there is this yeah. paradox that yeah. if you wanted to see American films, you had to be a good university student in good ah. standing with the fascist uh, regime because they had an exception and they had access as a club, private. Well, to American films, uh, to some of them. We must least. remember. I'm sure many sure many people here do that Mussolini was the one to, at the, the first, I think, politician to really understand the yeah. power of cinema, yeah. the, the power, the possible propaganda potentialities of cinema, which is why Vittorio, his son, his mm -hmm. eldest son, and Count Volpi founded the first ever film festival in Venice before the war. So, you know, the, he, he understood that, and so that's something that gave impetus, I think, to the film industry in the country, and that did provide, at the end of the war, people like Visconti, Rossellini, and then eventually Fellini, and so forth. With they just they were getting th they were getting bits of film from from the uh, American crews who were sent over to document the war, the post-war period. They they would give their extra the ends of the film rolls to like to Rossellini mm -hmm. for for Rome, Open City, for Paisa. That's how they made those movies, the splicing together bits of film. Any other question? Uh, yes, he wants. Well, he has. A, yes, go ahead. Yes. Uh, it really you. wasn't my idea. It was the producer who was uh, Nicoletta Ercole, Nico Max Film, who I met when we made Bye Bye Monkey together. She was the costume designer, and uh, I was the dialogue coach and assistant director. And when we moved, when we went to Italy to finish the shooting, after we finished at Cinecittà. She said, why don't you come stay with me? I was looking for a place to stay because I kept getting a lot of work there and I couldn't get arrested in Los Angeles. <laughs> Too arty <laughs> was the word. Uh, so I did, and we became good friends. We've, you know, sometimes we've lost sight of each other. And then two years ago, she called me up, and she said, Anselma, Marco's been dead for 20 years, and nobody remembers him anymore. Why don't we make a film and you direct it? I said, okay. <laughs> Where do I go? <laughs> um, <laughs> Thank you. And Asemna, your, your film was distributed in Italy by the Instituto Luce. 
Chinese so, Lassie. It, so it, it had a, a circulation in theaters? It's going, it's in art houses. The way this okay. works in Italy is that Luce con contacts the art houses and they, and so they, they organize a trip. I've been do I did that for the, for the, in the fall. I was doing that up until I left to come to New York for Christmas. You go to the places, it's, it's a lot of traveling on trains and they're little art houses and very selected art house pu uh, publics, audiences. And that, and that's where they're presented, and I, they do, we do this kind of Q and A afterwards. So it's 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 like uh, it's spotty, it's like that. But it's ha I'll go back and do some more. Be traveling all over. Okay. Well, the point of this film is was to get people interested in his Absolutely. films again. And the yeah. good thing is that retrospectives are right now being planned in Italy, in Milan, in Naples, in Rome. And Metrograph is interested in doing it here. What we, what we're do, what's happening now is these films are all about rights, and finding the rights. Who has the rights? Some people, most people, just have like the Italian rights, or they might have the Italian or the French, or not even. Sometimes it's all split up, so you have to chase them down and pay for them, and it's 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 hard to do and it's expensive, and that's the producer's job. That's a, and that's what they're they, there's somebody doing that now chasing down the rights and, and finding the money to pay for them so that they can get distributed. But, and this here. is one of the results of your work. And that's, that's and absolutely right. And when I mentioned I was at the New York Film Festival in the fall, I was speaking to Wendy Case from the New York Film Festival, and next to her was Gavin, I forget his last name, who, who programs Metrograph. As mm -hmm. soon as he heard the name Marco Ferrari, he didn't even hear about the film, my film, he said, I want to do a retrospective on him. So it's by, by getting the name out there again, getting the film out, it's, that's what's happening. So I expect there will be here as well. There will be, there will, because they're beautiful films. Absolutely. They're wonderful films. And at a time when they're not all that great, <laughs> there's some good films out there, but not, it's not a great, historically great cinema period. So thank you for doing this, and thank you for having brought it to thank us. Thank you for coming. Thank you.